It has a number of use cases for custody, layer one utilization, and non-interactive layer two setups. Uh, there's a lot of really good material at utxos.org, which you can check out after the talk to get a little bit more in depth with how CTV works. But this is going to be a high level talk. We're going to show some applications, uh, discuss why it's good, um, and there's a lot to dig into uh, you, you know, on your own time. CTV has a BIP, which is like a formal specification, which would be a lot to go through in the scope of this talk. So instead, I think I can summarize most of what CTV is doing in one slide and any of the nitty gritty little details you can pick up by reading the BIP on your own. So CTV upgrades in OpNOP, OpNOP4, um, to have verify semantics. This is usually how an OpNOP upgrade is done because it's software compatible with old client implementations. You are making transaction script processing more restrictive than it was before. So a previously valid script is now invalid, but it's using one of these OpNOPs, which no one uses in their scripts because they are specifically for upgrades. What the new opcode does is it checks that the provided argument, which is a hash, matches against the hash of certain parts of transaction data. This data includes most things in the transaction, notably not including the CL points, which tell you which input is being spent. These hash fields are partially merkleized, which gives you some efficiency in validation, as well as in uh, writing advanced scripts in the future. Uh, and the hash fields are kind of in an order that makes sense. This type of opcode would be allowed in a bare script or in SegWit. Uh, and we're protected from several of the gotchas that would come up with a basic form of this type of thing uh, with respect to address reuse uh, by committing to the input index being spent. It's uh, up friendly for future upgrades. Uh, you can version the hash and it would be compatible with opcat or shock 256 stream if those were to come out in the future. Essentially what this is verifying is we're verifying that the transaction that spends this coin creates a specific set of other UTXOs. So given a UTXO that has a hash and then op CTV, we can tell given the pre-image of that hash exactly which outputs will get created. And if you were to put that in a you know branch thing where it's like if and then one CTV uh, else another CTV, you can conditionalize what effect happens. So this is the you know sort of fundamental thing that CTV is doing. It's a little bit heady, but we're going to look at some examples that will make that a little bit more concrete in a moment. So one example that I really like is a time release vault. So in a time release vault, you move funds from cold to hot in small increments per unit time. And for each increment, you have a window of time where you can undo send and put it back into cold storage. Uh, and you have an undo send functionality to send the entirety of the remaining contract into cold storage as well. Another application is a batch compression where you gather a list of people that you want to pay and then you make a batch payment. But you split that batch into two parts and that's sort of what's novel here, a send part and a receive part. This makes it more efficient to get the send confirmed and the receive can happen sometime later when fees have perhaps gone down. So there are a lot of other applications that are really, really exciting that I'd love to talk to you about, like payment pools, non-interactive channels, batch channels, etc. But I actually have demo code uh, that I can show you in a demo wallet for the first two. So I want to focus on those because they're sort of, in my opinion, the most exciting. So let me switch over to those now. So what we're looking at is a application that I put together that allows you to create Bitcoin smart contracts and interact with them. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new wallet vault right now. So as I mentioned, a wallet vault is sort of this time release vault. I'm going to say withdraw from my cold storage 0.1 Bitcoin per step. We're going to do five steps. In between steps, there should be a 10 block pause and our withdrawal timeout um, should be after one block. So I'm going to go ahead and submit this. Now what this has done is this has populated our wallet with a smart contract vault. It hasn't actually created it yet. So the marching ants around here tell us that this transaction has not actually yet been created. So let's go ahead and actually create this. So we're going to broadcast it. And now after our block confirms, uh, I have a very fast block rate running it on my node right now. Um, the marching ants go away. Um, so we've gone ahead and created a 
wallet vault with 0.5 Bitcoin in it. And essentially what happens is there's a backbone upon which value flows. Um, and at every step, we emit a subcontract. So this subcontract, we have uh, an output of 0.5. We emit one subcontract of 0.1 Bitcoin and one subcontract with 0.4 Bitcoin. So in the 0.1 Bitcoin side, we have the option of either moving the funds to hot storage or to cold storage. So let's go ahead and move. Um, well, so we need to take the first step in our contract. We're going to take this. This is going to expand the first node. And now let's look at what our options are. So we can either go to hot or to cold. Now, if we want to go to hot, we can see more under this out point here. It actually has a sequence of 10, which means that we have to wait uh, for 10 uh, blocks to go by before we can move it to hot storage. Whereas if we want to go to cold, there's no associated wait. We can immediately move it to cold. So it's been 10 blocks on my computer. So let's go ahead and move it. Now, what we see is after uh, broadcasting this transaction, immediately the cold storage path has been pruned. And so we can continue doing this along our um, transaction path. Here we have a choice of either moving the rest of the funds to cold storage or continuing. Let's continue. I'm going to broadcast this. And now our ability to move to cold storage at that step has gone away. And at this stage, now let's say, oh, we had a problem. Let's move this to cold storage. Now we've pruned the rest of our tree away, and we can now, with this one, move this one to also to cold storage. So essentially what this has let us do is build a smart contract uh, vault that moves a small amount of funds per unit time. So if we look at this UTXO, uh, or at this transaction, this output had a sequence of one, so we had to wait a block before we took the next step. And we're able to go step by step by step moving funds from cold to hot, uh, and if there's ever a problem, we can automatically move funds back to HUD. Let's just create a new one so that you can look at this again one more time. Let's do uh, 10 steps this time with a step timeout of uh, 10. And well, let's do some different numbers in here. Okay, so you can see again, this is a bigger smart contract vault. So we have this backbone, which is creating a contract. And at each step, we have a small micro withdrawal until we get to the end. And then we moved all our funds. So if you look down here, we have the last step, which is just 0.1 Bitcoin. And then um, you know, we can either move from cold to hot. So that's one application that is pretty cool. The other application that I'm really excited to share with you today is uh, for transaction batching. So if we want to do a batch payment, we have another UX here. Um, now let me copy some test data that I prepared um, that is going to make 100 payments. So I've copied, copied that over. Uh, and I'm going to set the radix to uh, zero so that we get it uh, packed. And you'll see what that means. So now what this is doing is creating a two-step transaction, like I mentioned. So when we're up here at the top, we just have this single tiny transaction that we can broadcast. So let's go ahead and broadcast that. So now this is confirmed. And then beneath it, we have a CTV commitment to doing this other really big transaction. And this really big transaction, if we zoom out, pays like all 100 people. So we've got like all these people lined up getting their payment out from, uh, from this transaction. But why this is significant is this was really uh, high priority to confirm because it confirms all these payments. And then this expansion of these UTXOs is actually less time sensitive. So we can afford to pay a lower fee rate for the bulk of our data. And you can see intuitively this is way more data. So now let's broadcast that. And now all of our payments have been confirmed. So all of these guys are now confirmed payments. And each person has received you know, whatever amount they were supposed to get. But let's look at this with some other parameters. So let's go ahead and make a new batch payment. And now let's put in a radix of 10. So what this has done is this has taken a similar initial setup, but instead of breaking it up uh, into uh, two transactions, now it's broken up into a tree. And what this does for us is let's go ahead and start broadcasting components. Let's broadcast the root of this transaction tree. If we wanted to get out, say, this, this one right here, just this output, then we say, OK, let's go to its uh, you know, highest ancestor, broadcast that, wait for that to confirm. And then this one, broadcast that, wait for it to confirm. So we've actually only had to go through basically three small transactions in order to get uh, our coin out. 
compared to the entirety of the tree. And this ends up being more efficient for just any individual wanting to get their funds out rather than having to expand all the outputs. We can only expand log n of them. Uh, so this is a kind of cool idea for any uh, business or exchange that has a lot of customers that they need to pay. This helps decongest the blockchain. All right, we're going to swing back over into the presentation now um, and talk a little bit more about the theory of why this is so good. So as I said, these are compressed batch payments. Essentially what you're doing is something that's already been done in Bitcoin. You have a payment, you have another payment, and at a certain point it makes sense to combine them together down into a single transaction because you're going to save on signatures and change outputs among others. Um, what's new about this is you're breaking it up into a two-phase payment. And you have, instead of having a single phase, which is both spend and create, you have a spend phase, and then you have a create phase. And this breaks up the bandwidth into two separate parts, and each part has a different priority level. Um, and this is sort of like the big idea. You can then, you know, as noted before, you can then break up the structure into different structures, like a linked list or into a tree. Um, and what's, what's important about this is this gives you this logarithmic benefit of if I am trying to receive a payment, I only need to receive log n data or broadcast log n data in order to redeem my funds rather than having to pay for everyone um, if I were to not use a tree. So you can compare the spending tree payment and the receiving tree payment with the uh, original batch payment and you can see that it's a lot less data that each individual is going to have to possess. So what's also neat about this is let's say that somebody else has broadcast uh, transaction D and I own tra uh, transaction E. I've got output six that I want to create. Once somebody has paid for that, it's actually an amortized cost. So E only has to broadcast the small amount of additional data rather than the entire branch. So the fee savings uh, sort of work well um, cooperatively. Uh, at the same time, in terms of uh, blockchain long-term storage, these interior nodes are mostly deterministic, and so they can actually be pruned out over time, and you can just keep a small amount of data to keep the structure of the tree intact. Um, so in terms of block space usage, I think that this should be pretty favorable. This is kind of like an SPD payment. In an SPD payment, you don't receive the entire block. You just receive a Merkle path to your transaction in the block, and then you check that that um, you know, actually paid you. With CTV, it's a Merkle tree inside of a transaction that creates other transactions, and then you just retain the proof in order to actually ever be able to expand your output. So there's sort of a similarity to this with SPV or to things like uh, transaction output proofs, which are um, another active proposal. So why do we even care about this? Uh, this kind of uses a little bit more chain space because these in interior node transactions are a little bit like a, a scheduler with some overhead. Just using Lightning kind of seems like it's better. Vaults are more exciting. You know, there are a number of reasons why you might doubt that this is an important thing to look at. Well, here's the reason why. Batch payments like this end up being the worst case for any layer two protocol that you build on top of Check Template Verify. So you can imagine that instead of paying out individual outputs, we could be creating millions of channels in a single output. And we could novate up that tree. So we could say, hey, look, and I'll, I'll go back to the, uh, you know, uh, to the demo just so that you can see a tree. We could say each of these are lightning channels. And when you get together with your two people and you find you know, the other 10 people in your channel and you say, hey, let's update and make a payment across all of our channels, then you could sign off at this layer. And then you could go up another layer and you could sign off at that layer. But as you go up, you have more and more people trying to coordinate and the probability that you're going to coordinate might actually go down. And so what's, what the fundamental use case is with batching is that we are going to set up a, a baseline that works really well for deferring and delaying block space utilization. That's why we care about this so much. Further, there are a lot of lessons to learn from structuring the uh, smart contracts for batching. There are a lot of designs that you can play with that generalize to other types of smart contract program like vaults that you're going to build using Check Template Verify. So that's why it's really important to analyze how Check Template Verify works for batching. So I want to show some simulations that I worked on. And we don't quite have time to get into how these simulations are implemented, but 
they're online and reproducible, so you can check them out uh, on your own time. Uh, but I just want to talk about the results. So imagine you have a three-day period, um, and you have two transaction uh, demand spikes that are represented by this black line up top. The blue line represents the maximum average transactions per second. So what happens is we have too many transactions, we're gonna have a backlog, and then we drop down below, and then the next day, we go above, way above, but we never go back down beneath. So we're going to create a backlog of transactions somewhere. Now, this graph assumes that 25% of transaction load is using Check Template Verify. So what happens to our mempool? If we don't have Check Template Verify congestion control, our mempool looks like this blue line. We see the first spike and man, do we build up a backlog. But by the time we get to the second backlog, we're basically cleared, but when we hit that, because we never go below our rate of replacement, we end up building a permanent backlog. And this number never really ends up materially going down. The orange line shows us what we get if we have Check Template Verify. Yeah, we still see some mempool backlog, but it basically immediately clears out mostly. And what's important to note is that for the people who are using the congestion control mechanisms, their transactions are clearing almost immediately. Now the trade-off is that we create this middle graph, which is the confirmed congestion control pending. These are outputs that are confirmed, so people aren't worried that their funds aren't going to be sent to them. However, they don't quite have an output created on the chain yet. They can go to the chain anytime they want, but they don't have an output yet. So that's how this decongestion effect is actually granted. There are things that aren't getting created that at some time later we're going to have to create. Now, I want to talk about how batching is actually going to get deployed in the world, you know, in sort of the long term. There's something that I like to call heterogeneous priority batching. A little bit of a mouthful, but the basic idea is that if I have, let's say, a thousand customers and 250 of them are VIPs and I want to issue a transaction batch, well, I kind of need to do two transaction batches. One transaction batch for the VIP paying the VIP rate and another for the people who we don't care about as much. Now, if you have different priorities for your transactions, you end up getting essentially a bucket per band of priority. You could think of this a little bit like boarding on an airplane when they have different boarding groups. They try and do things in order of who they want to do the least inconvenience to. And it turns out that by, ba by batching things by these uh, bins using kind of like a histogram function, you save fees because you're not overpaying for the priority of something that you don't care about. So that's a key idea that I think would happen in batching today anyways. Now, if you have Check Template Verify, it turns out that you can do this type of histogrammed uh, heterogeneous priority batching more efficiently. So the argument that I'm going to make and I'm going to show in a simulation is that if there is a distribution of priorities for transactions, that a business is making, then it's more efficient fee-wise to do heterogeneous priority batching, and it's even more efficient to use Check Template Verify to do that priority batching. So I have a simulation which simulates the mempool and simulates different uh, transaction um, uh, you know, demands, and it actually does show this. This is pretty hard to parse on a slide, so I'd recommend just looking at this blog post uh, when, you, when you have the chance. It's pretty comprehensive and goes over the, the concrete details of what each strategy is doing, but this does actually show the effect that I wanted to show. It shows that heterogeneous binning is more efficient, and if you use Check Template Verify, it's also more uh, efficient than that um, and can minimize the amount of fees that exchanges are paying. So. This is important, uh, and I guess I'll, I'll go back to the slide for a second. This is important because what this says, there's a little bit of a concern that, hey, look, you're adding this cool check template verify thing, but the reality is if we just did the old fashioned style batching, so the one that's like this, we would have the minimum amount of on-chain overhead, right? So what we're doing is we're proving that, hey, that's not what you're going to do. What you're actually going to do looks like this. It's going to be split up by bins of priorities, and this is a more efficient way of doing that. So that's why this proof is so important. Uh, it shows that Check Template Verify uh, doesn't introduce any sort of like new bad behavior. It's strictly better than what we were doing before. Who could, who could hate strictly better? So I want to talk about sort of like a more high level uh, thing just to uh, 
get you thinking about what you might be able to build with Check Template Verify and what sort of abstractions are worthwhile to think about. So I want to first think about what an address is. When you receive an address in Bitcoin, it's supposed to be kind of like a public key, but it's not quite a public key. When you get a public key from somebody, you can wrap it in arbitrary script conditions. So for example, if you gave me your public key, I could make it into a public key with a check sig verify. Or I could say, OK, well, I'm going to give you a coin that's locked up for one month. It's a one month check sequence verify and then a check sig verify. So you can't spend the funds for a month. I can also conditionalize it in other ways with hash time locks and atomic swaps, all sorts of other protocols I can do with a public key. But when you give somebody an address, because it's hashed, it turns out that you can't wrap it with arbitrary script conditions. So you can't take an address and you can't add on to that address a one month check sequence verify. It just doesn't work uh, unless that address is telling you the public key. But this is what che check template verify changes. When I give you an address, you can now wrap it in an arbitrary check template verify flow. So I could say, OK, here's an address and pay out to that address after a month by going through this intermediary transaction. So essentially, Check Template Verify gives you tools to program uh, with things that are addresses, with arbitrary uh, sort of output descriptors that have to be exactly created in order for a payment to be considered made. So it's kind of an important distinction. We like addresses because addresses are sort of a contract where we say, hey, if you pay to this specific script, I will acknowledge and accept it. If you were to, you know, you could create coins that could be spent by a key, but somebody doesn't have the descriptor for that script, so they wouldn't know how to spend it. Check Template Verify bridges that gap by allowing you to have programmatic logic around addresses while still allowing to be recognized by legacy wallets. This is important because what this allows us to eventually come to, and this is sort of like hypothetical theoretical work, is you could write a programming language around Check Template Verify, which allows you to express different meta control programs that pay out to addresses. So on the right hand side, what I have sh showing you is the logic for the vault programs we looked at previously in the uh, vault demo, but I have them uh, sort of all templated out and you can just plug in arbitrary addresses and this should be able to compile down into a raw transaction description. This is pretty cool. This is something that we haven't been able to do in Bitcoin before. We haven't had the language and we haven't had the programmability at the transaction level. At the script level is one thing, but at the transaction level, you get a lot of new primitives around splitting funds and time controls that um, you know ha have previously been slightly out of reach, or you've had to use ways that are hard for third parties to engage with. Um, Check Template Verify provides this you know, sort of non-interactive kernel that allows you to build really, really, really uh, fantastic smart contracts. So what are the uh, next steps uh, for Check Template Verify? Uh, I mean, I'd like to get it deployed in Bitcoin. That requires a soft fork. Uh, that's sort of the obvious thing. It requires a deployment plan. But before we can get to a deployment plan, there's a little bit more work we have to do. So I am once again asking for you to review BIP 119. It's out there. You can look at it. You can see exactly what it says. You can write on the mailing list with every detail that you're not sure about. We have a uh, IRC channel, which is uh, pound pound CTV BIP review. I'd encourage you all to join there and ask questions. Um, I think the BIP is in a pretty good spot. I think we can move towards consensus, but moving towards consensus requires all of you to participate. I'm once again asking for you to review the CTV implementation. So the BIP has a corresponding implementation that if we wanted to could be merged in Bitcoin today, but it can't be merged until we actually get robust and rigorous peer review on that implementation. So I'm asking for you to go ahead and do that implementation, that implementation review and check it out. Make sure that we're matching the BIP semantics exactly. I'm once again asking for you to integrate CTV into your designs. CTV is really cool, and it's going to make a lot of things that people are working on way easier to do, way more secure, and it's going to make sort of like, if we get some of these scripting capabilities, it's going to enable a lot of new protocols that we couldn't do before, um, especially around non-interactivity. So I'm asking for you to take a close look and integrate it into your designs, get some prototypes going. I'm happy to, uh, if you're you know, thinking about something, sit down and brainstorm how you can get it done. 
Lastly, I'm once again asking, as, as you know, the classic goes, for your financial support. This is completely open source work. Uh, I'm doing it under uh, grants and community sponsorship. If this is something that's important to you, I'd love to engage with you on how to actually financially support the work to ensure that it keeps on moving forward and we keep on making progress on making these fantastic use cases available for everyone. So thank you so much. Uh, that's all I have for you today. I have a few minutes for Q&A and I'll be joining in via a live stream. Thanks. Morning, Jeremy. Can you hear us? Morning. Great. So um, we have time for a couple hey. questions if you, anybody would like to approach the mics. Hi. Uh, I might be totally off base, but uh, one uh, of the things that we do in uh, using uh, Bitcoin, for example, for issuing uh, decentralized or self-sovereign identifiers is we try to reduce the cost of issuance and put the cost only on if you want to, for instance, rotate a key or revoke a key. So uh, does th will this apply to something like issuing a 1,000 identifiers and then only speculatively, you know that only one or three of them might ever be revoked in reality and save money on that? Yeah, that's actually a uh, fantastic question. That's one of the prime use cases that I want to support here. Um, you could issue thousands or even millions of identifiers, and only at the time of revocation would you require to go on chain to create that UTXO. But anyone, and this is one of the key points around non-interactivity, anyone could verify in that Merkle tree uh, any of the identifiers that exist. So there's no um, sort of like trusted uh, data. It just needs to be made available uh, off chain. Great. One last chance for questions coming up. Um, yep. Can you maybe cover some like criticism or uh, reason why we wouldn't want this integrated? Like maybe it breaks wallets or I don't know, something um, like that. Yeah. So in terms of compatibility, uh, CTD is actually uh, relatively good. It is a soft fork, which means that there's some stuff that you need to upgrade, but old wallets should be able to detect uh, uh, the sort of terminal uh, payment nodes from any CTD contract, because it just looks like a normal address uh, that's going to that wallet, but they wouldn't necessarily understand the ancestors of that payment, which is still basically the status quo for Bitcoin today. If you don't have a SegWit supporting wallet, for example, uh, you can still receive funds, but you, uh, you know, to an address that's a non-segwit address, but you might not understand the transaction that is paying you uh, fully. So it's a little, it's similar to, to that in terms of uh, uh, compatibility. Reasons not to to implement it, um, I think uh, it just basically comes down to if you believe that the ways of doing similar things in Bitcoin. Uh, today um, through things like pre-signed transactions are sufficient um, for your use case, uh, which I think there's a myriad of reasons why they're not sufficient. But if you do believe that, then maybe you don't need this. Or if you think that uh, we're going to, uh, in short order, enable um, some other things like any prev out, any script, and you're OK with doing something that has a lot more verification overhead, um, and you don't want future extensibility at the scripting level, then some other uh, features uh, can be implemented uh, in terms of some of these other upgrades, but a little bit less flexibly. So if you have like a much more narrowly focused uh, use case, you might have other ways that you'd be okay doing this today and you wouldn't need the new feature. I think uh, given the use cases that I'm excited about, um, you, you do really need specifically something like check and verify, not the alternatives, but other people might not share that opinion. Hey, so I, I have what might be a relatively simple question. So uh, if the user is the one who is waiting to receive their funds, uh, do they, would they be able to verify for themselves that, the, that they're included in that first transaction or would the signer of that UTXO have to like give them some kind of proof? How would that work? 
from like a um, user owner kind of interaction? Yeah, so, so the answer is uh, yes. Um, so you can't look at a hash and discover its free image. So you fundamentally would have to receive some data. But as soon as you have that data, you can verify it fully. There's no sort of like signature that you're looking for that you're asking that they only signed one thing with it, um, which is not possible for you to actually uh, verify. So once you've received that data, you can verify it. Um, those transactions for the interior nodes could be broadcast through the mempool, for example, um, or sent to you as sort of an SPV style proof. But you would need to receive that additional bit of data. Um, I think that this is a reasonable trade-off because if you look at how uh, existing uh, wallets should work, if you broadcast a transaction and then that transaction pays you, you would save its ancestors. And if you're running on a light client, you're already receiving things like SPV proofs of what your payment is. So you're already receiving uh, a Merkle path to your transaction. So this would just be a slight tack on to that logic. Great. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Yeah, thanks so much.